Welcome to the mythical astronomy of ice and fire. King Brain, Part 1. The Real Green Seer Kings of Ancient Westeros. Hey there, fellow mythical astronomers, LML here to talk about our newly crowned god king, Bran the Broken, first of his name. Thanks so much for tuning in, and please check out LucifermeansLightbringer.com for the matching text to this video, as well as the link to our Patreon campaign and everything else mythical astronomy. This video is brought to you by the generosity of our Patreon supporters, so all thanks to them. One of the most stunning aspects of the way HBO's Game of Thrones ended their version of the saga of ice and fire was, without a doubt, King Bran. Bran the Broken, as Tyrion somewhat awkwardly dubs him. Seems like we could give him a title that's a shade more respectful, but nonetheless, there it is. Brandon Stark, the broken boy who fell from the tower, journeyed north to the Weirwood Cave of the Three-Eyed Raven to learn the magic of the Weirwoods, and then came back as the host body for some sort of green seer, hive mind, collective consciousness thing, became the king of Westeros. It's something basically no one predicted. I mean, I'm sure someone out there got it, and if you did, good for you. But, for the most part, no one saw this coming, and how shall we say this, it didn't really make a ton of sense to everyone when it happened on the show. As I mentioned in the Battle of Winterfell video, the decision by the HBO showrunners to simplify the magical elements of the story, particularly the magic of the Weirwoods and the Greenseers, had the effect of stunting Bran's role in the conclusion of the story. In both the show and the book version of the story, Bran gaining access to the magic of the Weirwoods means that he gains access to basically the entire history of everything that has happened in Westeros. And although you'd think the reason for Bran to get this power would be so that he can discover some secret about the White Walkers, which is essential to their defeat, this turned out not to be the case. Bran did, of course, see the creation of the Night King at the hands of the Children of the Forest, but as we said last time, this knowledge didn't turn out to be needed to defeat them. For the most part, Bran used his knowledge of history to help learn the full truth of R plus L equals J, and that's about it. And then, after doing next to nothing in the final battle against the White Walkers, and after saying, I'm the Three-Eyed Raven now, I can't be the lord of anything, he becomes the king of Westeros. This, to me, feels very like the skeleton of a plotline which has had a lot of the flesh removed. Call it a zombie plotline, or maybe a whited plotline. In other words, it seems like the HBO showrunners kept the major beats of Bran's story, as told to them by George R. R. Martin several years ago, but then changed a lot of other things, which, due to the butterfly effect, left some of those plot beats standing in a kind of senseless isolation. It's one of the pitfalls of adapting a longer, more complex story from a series of books to the television medium, and it should be noted that because so much of Bran's story occurs in his own head in Dreams and Visions, it poses a particular challenge. Well, I'm here to tell you that Bran doing next to nothing in the battle against the others and then sort of inexplicably becoming king of Westeros isn't going to go down like that in the books. I think we can expect Bran and his weirwood magic to play a much more active role in the book version of the Endgame, and I'm here to show you some of the things that Bran might do in the fight against the others. Bran will be king, yes, but he's going to be a green seer king, and we're going to have to dive into the ancient legends of the first men to reveal the dark and terrible truth of what a green seer king actually means. And it will be dark. Consider the words of Blood Raven to Bran concerning the power of the green seers. Never fear the darkness, Bran. The Lord's words were accompanied by a faint rustling of wood and leaf, a slight twisting of his head. The strongest trees are rooted in the dark places of the earth. Darkness will be your cloak, your shield, your mother's milk. Darkness will make you strong. Just as Bran's weirwood powers enable him to make use of ancient history, so too shall we make use of ancient Westerosi history to enlighten our quest to understand King Bran. The notion of a green seer king or a skin changer king is absolutely suggested by the old legends of the Seven Kingdoms, beginning with those of the Starks and the First Men of the North. In a section of the World of Ice and Fire that concerns the consolidation of the North by the ancient Stark Kings of Winter, we read about the Warg King. Chronicles found in the archives of the Night's Watch at the Night Fort before it was abandoned speak of the war for Sea Dragon Point wherein the Starks brought down the Warg King and his inhuman allies, the Children of the Forest. When the Warg King's last redoubt fell, his sons were put to the sword, along with his beasts and greenseers, while his daughters were taken as prizes by their conquerors. 
So here in the Age of Heroes, or sometime not long after, we have this fellow called the Ward King who employs multiple green seers in his army. That's really something because of the well-known statistics concerning green seer and skin changer birth rates. Only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, Lord Brynden said one day, after Bran had learned to fly. And only one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. In other words, there should be many more people born with skin changer ability than green seer ability. If the warg king had multiple green seers in his army, he may have had many more wargs and skin changers of other beasts in his army as well. Or it may be that the history speaks loosely here, using the term skin changer and green seer interchangeably. Either way, this story speaks of a warg who became a powerful king, and whose subjects and allies included other green seers and wargs and the children of the forest. That is a force to be reckoned with. We can't fail to observe that the Starks are said to have taken the daughters of the Warg King as, quote, prizes. As we know, this means that some of those unfortunate daughters were probably made to marry into House Stark, or at least bear them offspring, thus introducing skin-changer genetics into the Stark bloodline if they weren't there already. The theory that this is where the Starks first got their skin-changer genetics became fairly popular after the World of Ice and Fire was released, for what it's worth. The Starks did a similar thing when they married the daughter of the Marsh King, which is the legendary title of the Kings of the Cranog Men, whom the histories say grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the neck. According to the World of Ice and Fire, the Marsh King is strongly implied as a Greenseer King. Check it out. Long ago, the histories claim, the Cranog Men were ruled by the Marsh Kings, Singers tell of them riding on lizard lions and using great frog spears like lances. But that is clearly fancy. Were these marsh kings even truly kings, as we understand it? Archmaester Aaron writes that the Cranach men saw their kings as the first among equals, who are often thought to be touched by the old gods. The fact that this was said to show itself in eyes of strange hues or even in speaking with animals, as the children are said to have done. Whatever the truth, the last man to be called Marsh King was killed by King Rickard Stark, sometimes called the Laughing Wolf in the North for his good nature, who took the man's daughter to wife, whereupon the Cranach men bent their knees and accepted the dominion of Winterfell. We know that green seers and skin changers can communicate with animals, and Blood Raven confirms to Bran that among the children of the forest, the green seer gift is marked by the presence of eyes as red as blood or as green as the moss on a tree. Therefore, this historical account is consistent with what we know at the very least, and it strikes me as accurate. The ancient Cranog men seem to have chosen green seers for the office of Marsh King, and thus we have green seer kings whom the Stark Kings of Winter conquered and intermarried with. There's another legend of a skin-changer war won by the ancient Starks, though it makes no specific mention of intermarriage. Ancient ballads, amongst the oldest to be found in the archives of the Citadel of Old Town, tell of how one King of Winter drove the giants from the north, whilst another felled the skin-changer Gavin Greywolf and his kin in the savage war of the wolves. But we have only the word of singers that such kings and such battles ever existed. When you consider the grey direwolf on white sigil of the Starks, one wonders if this Gavin Grey Wolf, skin changer warlord guy, might not have been related to the Starks. It's a bit like a cadet branch of House Stark taking the name Grey Stark, or Car Stark, perhaps. So who are these Starks who relentlessly conquer armies led by fearsome warg kings and clever greenseer kings riding lizard lions, as well as a bunch of other northern houses? Well, I have to think that they must have been warg kings in their own right. Why else would every single statue of the enthroned ancient Stark kings of winter and kings in the north have a direwolf at their side, if not to indicate the Starks' history as kings who were also wargs? We see precisely one Stark King in the main story of A Song of Ice and Fire so far, and he is a Warg King, King Rob. That's right, George has said all the Stark children were Wargs, and in the battle against the Lannisters, Rob sends his wolf, Grey Wind, to frighten the horses at the beginning of the attack. And when Lancel Lannister reports back to Cersei and Sansa of the battle, this is what we hear. Using some vile source, your brother fell upon Sir Stafford Lannister with an army of wargs not three days' ride from Lannisport. Thousands of good men were butchered as they slept, 
without the chance to lift sword. After the slaughter, the Northmen feasted on the flesh of the slain. Tyrion rightly discerns that these are wild tales based on Rob taking his wolf into battle with him, but says to Sansa that those who survived are spreading wild tales and swearing that the old gods of the North march with your brother. Though exaggerated, these tales were easily spread and believed because the Starks and the First Men as a whole do have a known history of being skin changers, wargs, and greenseers. To me, when we see the Stark children gain individual pet direwolves and then begin to awaken their skin changer powers, it reads more like the rediscovery of an ancient magical heritage than anything else. Lest I forget our special snowflake, yes, if Jon Snow becomes Jon Stark, king in the north as he does in the show, which I think he might, he will also be a warg king, although I think the emphasis for Jon will probably shift to dragons and more esoteric matters related to being the nexus point of ice and fire, and these are topics we'll cover in another video. Still, he'd be another Stark warg king, just like Rob, which would make us two for two in the main story. When you take a look, I believe the evidence does suggest that the Starks have probably always been skin changers and perhaps even green seers, right from the beginning of their house. The World of Ice and Fire speaks of Brandon the Builder, the supposed founder of House Stark, seeking the aid of the children while attempting to build the wall, saying that He was taken to a secret place to meet with them, but could not at first understand their speech, which was described as sounding like the song of stones in a brook, or the wind through leaves, or the rain upon the water. The manner in which Brandon learned to comprehend the speech of the children is a tale in itself and not worth repeating here. The last hero, who may have been a Stark like Brandon the Builder, also sought the aid of the Children of the Forest, so it seems that, right from the beginning, the Starks have had ties to the Children of the Forest at the very least. Learning to speak their language, called the True Tongue, would seem to take some time and effort, and therefore speaks of a close and collaborative relationship. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the ancient Starks interbred with the children of the forest at this time, but it does mean that the situation where something like that could occur did exist. It should be noted that everywhere Brandon built, Winterfell, the Wall, Storm's End, and the High Tower of Old Town, we also find stories of humans working with the children of the forest in some capacity. Because of the fact that Bran the Builder was remembered as a child who built things in some tales, and because of certain clues that Brandon of the Bloody Blade, a probable ancestor of Bran the Builder, may have been impregnating children of the forest near Red Lake in the Reach in the most ancient days. There is even speculation that Brandon the Builder himself was a human, child of the forest hybrid. If that was the case, Brandon would be both very short and half-child in a sense. And this could have given rise to the legends of a boy who builds things using powerful magic and great cunning. And when we think about Bran the Builder being taken to a secret place to meet with the children of the forest and to learn their language, well, doesn't that just sound like our own young Brandon Stark being led to a secret cave to meet the children of the forest and to learn their greenseer magic? In other words, the idea of Bran the Builder, founder of House Stark, being either a greenseer and or part child of the forest is very possible, and perhaps even likely. Consider this passage from A Dance with Dragons, which portrays the Starks as being under the watchful protection of the old gods, right on down through the generations. This is also the first clue that we get that Bran might be able to affect the past, and also our first first-hand account of green seeing, so it's worth quoting. Bran closed his eyes and slipped free of his skin into the roots, he thought, into the weirwood become the tree. For an instant, he could see the cavern in its black mantle, could hear the river rushing below. Then all at once he was back home again. Lord Eddard Stark sat upon a rock beside the deep black pool in the godswood, the pale roots of the heart tree twisting around him like an old man's gnarled arms. The great sword ice lay across Lord Eddard's lap as he was cleaning the blade with an oilcloth. Winterfell, Bran whispered. His father looked up. Who's there? he asked, turning. And Bran, frightened, pulled away. His father and the black pool and the gods would faded and were gone, and he was back in the cavern, a pale, thick root of his weirwood throne, cradling his limbs, as a mother does a child. A torch fled to life before him. The roots of the Winterfell heart tree wrap around Ned like an old man's gnarled arms while the weirwood roots of Bran's nest wrap around Bran like a mother cradling a child. 
Is this a poetic way of showing us that the Starks are the children of the old gods, that their connection to the old gods runs deep all the way back to the roots of their entire lineage? Did some of the most ancient Starks sit in weirwood thrones, going all the way back to Brandon the Builder? I mean, it's not exactly far-fetched, right? In similar poetic fashion, Catelyn's inner monologue introduces us to the Heart Tree by saying that it was older than Winterfell itself, and that its strangely watchful eyes had seen Brandon the Builder set the first stone, if the tales were true. This seems like another way of saying that the old gods have been watching the Starks from the beginning. Ah, what a lucky man he was, that Brandon the Builder. So while I'd place my bets on the Starks being Greenseer kings and Warg kings from the first, implying intermarriage with the children of the forest, we can see that they've also received at least two major infusions of bloodlines that manifest Skin Changer and Greenseer powers. Greenseer kings and Warg kings did exist, and at some point, some of those Stark kings of winter and kings of the north would surely have been among them. In other words, if our beloved Bran Stark becomes a Green Seer King, he won't be the first person to do so, nor even the first Stark. Let's talk Green Seer powers for a second, according to book canon, so that we can begin to picture what a Green Seer King might look like. First off, we know the Green Seers are also skin changers and could potentially skin change any animal, and we'll talk about the potential of this in a moment. We know that Green Seers can access all of history, which Bloodraven says is possible because weirwoods are eternal. He says that men live their lives trapped in an eternal present between the mists of memory and the sea of shadow that is all we know of the days to come, which is basically a longer and more cryptic way of saying all men must die. Bloodraven says that weirwoods, on the other hand, will live forever if undisturbed, and to them, past, present, and future are one, and this enables green seers who skin change the trees to look where you will and to see what the trees have seen. So we got that. Green seers like Bran can see through the trees and view the past, and they could potentially skin change any animal they want to, up to and including human beings. But there are two common misconceptions about the limits of a green seer that they can only access the weirwood net while sitting in a nest of weirwood roots, and that they can only see things that happened in front of heart trees. Neither are true. Bloodraven tells Bran that, The singers carved eyes into their heart trees to awaken them, and those are the first eyes a green seer learns to use. But in time, you will see well beyond the trees themselves. Aha, so green seers can potentially see more than just what happened in front of heart trees. That expands the playing field quite a bit. The TV show already went this way, but I wanted to make sure everyone realizes that this is book canon as well. The more important thing to realize in terms of grappling with the true potential of green seers is mobility. They do not actually have to be touching Weirwood at all to access the Weirwood net, as we learn at the end of Bran's last A Dance with Dragons chapter. After his first Weirwood paced session, where he sits in the Weirwood root nest and sees a series of visions through the eyes of the Winterfell heart tree, Hodor carries him back to his non-Weirwood sleeping chamber, and as he drifts off to sleep, he re-enters the Weirwood net and has another series of visions. Watching the flames, Bran decided he would stay awake till Mira came back. Jojen would be unhappy, he knew, but Mira would be glad for him. He did not remember closing his eyes. But then somehow he was back at Winterfell again, in the Godswood, looking down upon his father. It's interesting that Bran is watching the flames here, almost like Melisandre when he drifts off. But the real point here is simple. Now that Bran is wedded to the trees, he doesn't seem to need to be touching weirwood trees to access their knowledge. There's actually nothing besides a bunch of inconveniently placed whites and the lack of a good wheelchair to prevent him from being a mobile green seer, which is entirely different from green seers trapped in out-of-the-way caves. This is very important, and explains how Bran could come back to the lands of the living and become a powerful and respected figure in full possession of his weirwood powers, as opposed to being confined to a dark cave and visiting people only in spooky dreams. As for Bloodraven, he is pinioned to the root nest because the weirwoods are actually extending his physical life. But otherwise, he wouldn't be restricted to a lonely cave in the isolated north and could try to amass power and become a king or whatever else. It's actually an open question as to how much green seer and skin changer magic Blood Raven might have been using during his long tenure as King's Hand, for that matter. So, the Blood Raven that we meet in the Weirwood Cave is old and frail and shot through with Weirwood roots, and Bran is unfortunately without the use of his legs. They can still be very powerful in battle, wielding their green seer powers from a remote location, but think about, say, Robert Baratheon with green seer abilities. 
a green seer who could walk and talk and lead men into battle. That would be a terrible thing indeed, and an impressive, awe-inspiring sight. That's what we should imagine when we think of a war king going into battle with his beasts and green seers, or even some of the ancient Stark kings of winter going to battle with packs of dire wolves. Mobile green seers who can control flocks of ravens and packs of wolves, who can access the entire weirwood net to spy on their enemies or gain crucial knowledge, and who, most poignantly, are not stuck in a cave somewhere. After all, it's hard to be elected king if you can't leave your weirwood cave. Green seer kings are terrible, yet logical. Inevitable, even, once man gained access to the power of the old gods. Any time one person gains significant might and power, there will be others who cede them authority. And it stands to reason that many of these powerful green seer and skin changer lords and kings surely had the support of their people, as the Starks mostly do. The first Stark green seer or war king may have been the last hero, and he may have helped end the long night, so that may have been the kind of guy who could win public support for king. Now, it is also true that any time mankind gains any level of power, some people will abuse that power and use it to dominate others. And many of the ancient green seer kings and warg kings surely rose to power this way. Consider the wildling skin changer Vermeer Sixskins, once called Lump, who was the most accomplished skin changer we meet in the books, and something of a petty tyrant. He wanted to be a warg king, though, once. The boy had dreamed of a day when bards would sing of his deeds and pretty girls would kiss him. When I am grown, I will be king beyond the wall. Lump had promised himself. He never had, but he had come very close. Varamir Sixkins was a name men feared. He rode to battle on the back of a snow bear thirteen feet tall, kept three wolves and a shadow cat in thrall, and sat at the right hand of Mance Raider. It was Mance who brought me to this place. I should not have listened. I should have slipped inside my bear and torn him to pieces. Before Mance, Varamir Sixkins had been a lord of sorts. He had lived alone in a hall of moss and mud and hewn logs that had once been Hagen's, attended by his beasts. A dozen villages did him homage in bread and salt and cider, offering him fruit from their orchards and vegetables from their gardens. His meat he got himself. Whenever he desired a woman, he sent his shadow cat to stalk her. Whatever girl he'd cast his eye upon would follow meekly to his bed. Some came weeping, aye, but still they came. Varamir gave them his seed, took a hank of their hair to remember them by, and sent them back. From time to time, some village hero would come with spear in hand to slay the beastling and save a sister or a lover or a daughter, those he killed. But he never harmed the women, some he even blessed with children. Runts, small puny things, like lump, and not one with the gift. Dark stuff, as I warned earlier. But Martin really isn't writing anything that wouldn't happen were mankind to really have this kind of magical ability. That's perhaps the most succinct distillation of George's writing style, if you ask me. He writes fantasy while constantly asking himself, what would people do if they really could ride dragons, or control animals, or see the future, or body snatch people, and so on. It seems inevitable that some of those among the first men who were born with the skin changer or green seer gifts would rise to power and prominence, becoming kings as the Starks were, and some of them would be very bad kings, no doubt. Consider Vermeer again. He's a cruel and selfish man, and not particularly clever or qualified in any way other than his possession of the gift. And yet, he almost became king beyond the wall, and was instead a powerful warrior at the right hand of the man who did. Before that, he was a lord of sorts, albeit a terrible sort of lord, using his power to rape women and dominate local villages. But don't forget that the Starks wiped out whole houses and clans and took their daughters as, quote, prizes while conquering the North. That's really not much different, and arguably worse. This is all part of the dark heritage of the power that Bran and the other Starks have inherited, and Martin is warning us about the dark places that it can go. Bran is on the way to being far more powerful than Vermeer, and he's already violated several of the skin changer taboos laid out by Vermeer's teacher, Hagon. Check out this passage from Vermeer's A Dance with Dragons prologue chapter, and once again, things are getting dark. Abomination. That had always been Hagen's favorite word. Abomination. 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 
To eat of human meat was abomination. To mate as wolf with wolf was abomination. And to seize the body of another man was the worst abomination of all. Hagen was weak, afraid of his own power. He died weeping and alone when I ripped his second life from him. Varimir had devoured his heart himself. He taught me much and more. And the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. Bran, of course, ate the flesh of the Night's Watch mutineers while his spirit was inside of Summer, his wolf, and then he unknowingly ate it again in his human body when Cold Hands brought it back and passed it off as pork so that they wouldn't starve. Bran hasn't made it as a wolf, which, thanks for sparing us that, George, but he has, of course, seized the body of Hodor on several occasions. Leaf also warns Bran against trying to call the dead back from the grave, but I have a feeling Bran might end up trying that one out too, for what it's worth. As for what a ward can do in battle, well, we don't see Varimir in action too much, but we can imagine. He controlled three wolves, an eagle, and most impressively, a shadow cat and a snow bear. That's a lot of firepower against humans in anything less than full steel plate armor, as would have been the case before the Andals came to Westeros. Perhaps most terribly, a skin changer can force their animal to attack without fear, and can afford to sacrifice those animals if need be, though it is physically painful to do so. Varimir can send his wolves or his shadow cat or his snow bear into battle and have them attack in ways that a wild animal would not. Harkening back to the tale of the Warg King who went into battle with many beasts and green seers, we can conjure up terrifying images of packs of wolves, ravens, bears, lions, or whatever else being sent into battle on a dark and stormy night, ravening their scared foes and, oh, what's this? Martin has already done a bit of this sort of thing? Well, all right, let's go to Queen's Crown, where young Bran, the warg prince of Winterfell, is flexing his skin changer muscle a bit. It's a great scene because George gives us both Bran's POV inside the tower and Jon's POV outside of it. The situation is this. Jon, having gone over to the wildlings at the command of Corn Halfhand, is now embedded with a party of wildling raiders who have climbed the wall and are making their way to Castle Black. On the way, they come across the abandoned village of Queen's Crown, which sits next to a lake with a watchtower on a small island in the middle. Earlier that day, however, Bran, Jojen, Mira, Hodor, and Summer had already arrived at Queen's Crown and had taken refuge inside the watchtower, although Summer was hunting outside and not actually in the tower. By the time Jon and the wildling party arrived, night had begun to fall, with a nasty storm kicking in as well. Bran and company try to keep quiet to avoid notice, which leads to Bran skin-changing Hodor to keep him from Hodoring too loudly when the lightning crashes. The wildlings hear anyway, though, and Bran slips into Summer's skin outside to investigate. At some point, realizing that Jon is there and that he's in danger, Bran decides to act. And it is then that we get the tiniest glimpse into the terrible power of a warg king in battle. The Magnar said something in the old tongue. He might have been telling the Thens to kill Jon where he stood, but he would never know the truth of that. Lightning crashed down from the sky, a searing blue-white bolt that touched the top of the tower in the lake. They could smell the fury of it, and when the thunder came it seemed to shake the night, and death leapt down amongst them. The lightning flash left John night blind, but he glimpsed the hurtling shadow half a heartbeat before he heard the shriek. The first then died as the old man had, blood gushing from his torn throat. Then the light was gone and the shape was spinning away, snarling, and another man went down in the dark. There were curses, shouts, howls of pain. John saw Big Boyle stumbled backward and knocked down three men behind him. Ghost, he thought for one mad instant. Ghost leapt the wall. Then the lightning turned the night to day, and he saw the wolf standing on Dell's chest, blood running black from his jaws. Grey, he's grey. Darkness descended with the thunderclap. The Thens were jabbing with their spears as the wolf darted between them. The old man's mare reared, maddened by the smell of the slaughter, and lashed out with her hooves. Longclaw was still in his hand. All at once, Jon Snow knew he would never get a better chance. All right, so that was one boy with one direwolf. And death leapt down among them. A skin-changer newbie, just beginning to learn to use his powers, and look at what he was able to do to these wildling raiders. Fighting against other armed men is terrifying enough, but with giant wolves controlled by wizards sitting in dark towers added into the mix, well, you can really feel the terror of the wildlings in this scene, even though we're actually rooting for Summer and Jon. Now think about what Bran might be able to do in battle after coming back from Bloodraven's cave. Again, it's going to be a bit more than 
going away for a while and flying some ravens around to sort of ineffectively spy on the Night King a bit. We can glean more clues about what powerful skin changers might look like in battle by delving back into ancient Westerosi history, just as an inquiring greenseer would. In a storm of swords, Arya and the Brotherhood Without Banners go to visit the Ghost of the High Heart, and Arya recalls that the enormous hill called the High Heart, which is crowned by 31 weirwood stumps, was said to be haunted by the ghosts of the children of the forest who had died here when the Andal king named Eric the Kinslayer had cut down their grove. Then in the world of ice and fire, we find out that there was, indeed, a great battle involved. The great hill called High Heart was especially holy to the first men, as it had been to the children of the forest before them, crowned by a grove of giant weirwoods, ancient as any that had ever been seen in the Seven Kingdoms, I Heart was still the abode of the children and their greenseers. When the Andal king Eric the Kinslayer surrounded the hill, the children emerged to defend it, calling down clouds of ravens and armies of wolves, or so the legends tell us. Yet neither tooth nor talon was a match for the steel axes of the Andals, who slaughtered the greenseers, the beasts, and the first men alike, and raised beside the high heart a hill of corpses half again as high, or so the singers would have us believe. Against steel plate armor, wolves and ravens aren't going to be very effective, sadly. Still, it sounds impressive. Green seers emerging from the hollow hill to call down clouds of ravens and armies of wolves. In another battle against the invading Andals, the children seem to have fared a little better, as the World of Ice and Fire tells us that the singers sing... Of the night... In the Whitewood, where supposedly the children of the forest emerged from beneath a hollow hill to send hundreds of wolves against an Andal camp, tearing hundreds of men apart beneath the light of a crescent moon. Got them before they could get their armor on, I'm guessing. You can pull that kind of surprise when you have ravens to spy with, which is another advantage for green seers and skin changers in battle, and one which we see Mance employ when attacking the Night's Watch. Even TV show brand does a bit of this, in fact. It's one of the few semi-useful things he does. Hooray! Overall, I think you can see the picture Martin is painting here, between these historical and legendary accounts of green seers and wargs in battle, and the little bit of experience that Bran got employing his wolf in battle at Queen's Crown. There is potential here for more. More wolves, did you say? How about that giant wolf pack in the Riverlands, led by Arya's direwolf, Nymeria? This was a dropped plot thread in the show where Arya is not a skin changer, but in the books, Arya is actually the most powerful Stark skin changer after Bran, as she's moved on to skin changing other animals like cats, and she's also able to warg into her wolf from all the way across the narrow sea in Bravos. We'll come right back to Bran in a moment, but check out Arya's long-range warg powers for a minute. Here is Arya as Cat of the Canals, recalling a wolf dream in Bravos. Cat sat with her legs crossed, fighting a yawn and trying to recall the details of her dream. I dreamed I was a wolf again. She could remember the smells best of all. Trees and earth, her pack brothers, the scents of horse and deer and man, each different from the others, and the sharp acrid tang of fear always the same. Some nights the wolf dreams were so vivid that she could hear her brothers howling even as she woke. And once Breya had claimed she was growling in her sleep as she thrashed beneath the covers. She thought that was some stupid lie, till Talia said it too. In a dance with dragons, Arya's night wolf identity asserts itself more and more, and the wolf dreams become more vivid. Here's the opening of her first A Dance with Dragons chapter. Her nights were lit by distant stars and the shimmer of moonlight on snow, but every dawn she woke to darkness. She opened her eyes and stared up blind at the black that shrouded her, her dream already fading. So beautiful, she licked her lips, remembering. The bleating of the sheep, the terror in the shepherd's eyes, the sound the dogs had made as she killed them one by one, the snarling of her pack. Game had become scarcer since the snows began to fall, but last night they had feasted, lamb and dog and mutton and the flesh of man. Some of her little grey cousins were afraid of men, even dead men, but not her. Meat was meat, and men were prey. She was the night wolf, but only when she dreamed. As we can see, Arya is a vicious little wolf girl, in addition to being a powerful skin changer. 
she revels in killing and shows no more compunction to avoid the, quote, skin changer taboos than Bran, at least when it comes to eating the flesh of man while in a wolf. Note that she's not afraid of the dead while in her wolf. That's going to be important by the end, I'd think. In the next paragraph after this one, she recites her list of names of the people she wants to kill and thinks, that is the night wolf's prayer. Someday she will find them, hunt them, smell their fear, taste their blood. Someday. Now look closely here. Martin has merged the foreshadowing of Arya's list of names with foreshadowing of Arya leading the wolf pack against her enemies. Actually, Arya has already led the wolf pack against a few people on her list of names, albeit unknowingly, when she, Hot Pie, and Gendry were fleeing Harrenhal. In fact, Arya falls asleep, whispering her list of names, her sword drawn at her side, and then wakes up to her wolf dream. So again, we see foreshadowing of Arya leading the giant wolf pack in association with her coming into her own as a faceless man assassin killer girl. This next quote serves the same purpose as Bran's chapter at Queen's Crown, essentially. Martin is giving us a little sneak peek of what the Stark wargs will be up to by the end. Her dreams were red and savage. The mummers were in them, four at least. A pale Lysenian, a dark, brutal axeman from Ib. The scarred Dothraki horse lord called Igo, and a Dornish man whose name she never knew. On and on they came, riding through the rain in rustling mail and wet leather, swords and axe clanking against their saddles. They thought they were hunting her, she knew, with all the strange, sharp certainty of dreams. But they were wrong. She was hunting them. She was no little girl in the dream. She was a wolf, huge and powerful, and when she emerged from beneath the trees in front of them and bared her teeth in a low, rumbling growl, she could smell the rank stench of fear from horse and man alike. The Lysini mount reared and screamed in terror, and the others shouted at one another in man-talk, but before they could act, the other wolves came hurtling from the darkness and the rain, a great pack of them gaunt and wet and silent. The fight was short, but bloody. The hairy man went down as he unslung his axe. The dark one died stringing an arrow, and the pale man from Lys tried to bolt. Her brothers and sisters ran him down, turning him again and again, coming at him from all sides, snapping at the legs of his horse and tearing the throat from the rider as he came crashing to the earth. Only the belled man stood his ground. His horse kicked in the head of one of her sisters, and he cut another almost in half with his curved silvery claw as his hair tinkled softly. Filled with rage, she leapt onto his back, knocking him head first from his saddle. Her jaws locked on his arm as they fell, her teeth sinking through the leather and wool and soft flesh. When they landed, she gave a savage jerk with her head and ripped the limb loose from his shoulder, exulting, she shook it back and forth in her mouth, scattering the warm red droplets amidst the cold black rain. As you can see, Arya is a natural. She's as wolfish as she can be, and that's only going to become more true when she returns to Westeros and reconnects with Nymeria. This last scene is frightening not only for its sheer viciousness, but for the fact that Arya is only 9 or 10 at this time, and is doing this in her dreams without even intending to use her power. How much more terrifying will she be when she comes into her own as a warg queen? Arya's wolfish nature is apparent to those with eyes to see, and this is something that is reinforced periodically throughout the story. The waif in the House of Black and White tells Arya that you have the eyes of a wolf and a taste for blood, again suggesting that Arya's ultimate vengeance will involve wolves and not just assassination. In similar fashion, the ghost of the High Heart foreshadows Arya's destiny in a storm of swords using some of the same words. The dwarf woman studied her with dim red eyes. I see you, she whispered. I see you, wolf child. Blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. Wolf child. Blood child. She's seeing the same thing the waif did when she said that Arya has the eyes of a wolf and a taste for blood. The foreshadowing seems clear. Arya's Nightwolf persona has only begun to feast on the blood of the slain. Indeed, this is where I think the show has dropped something big that Martin will not. I think we will see Arya leading the wolf pack as a war queen of sorts, most likely against the army of the dead, and perhaps against other foes before that. One thing I noticed is that when Bran thinks about the names his brothers and sisters gave their wolves, he thinks that... Arya named hers after some old witch queen in the songs, which is of course a reference to the Dornish queen Nymeria. Thinking about Arya naming her wolf after a witch queen, 
I'm seeing even more foreshadowing that Arya herself will be a sort of witch queen. Call her a warg queen, or warg princess, or maybe just the night wolf. In case you still harbor any doubt, let me cure you with this passage from early on in A Game of Thrones, where George seems to be giving us a hint about Arya's wolf pack destiny. Nymeria was waiting for her in the guardroom at the base of the stairs. She bounded to her feet as soon as she caught sight of Arya. Arya grinned. The wolf pup loved her, even if no one else did. They went everywhere together, and Nymeria slept in her room, at the foot of her bed. If mother had not forbidden it, Arya would gladly have taken the wolf with her to needlework. Let Septimordain complain about her stitches then. As the story progresses, needlework becomes a euphemism for swordplay, of course, based on Arya naming the sword John gave her Needle. So consider again the idea of Arya wanting to take Nymeria with her to needlework. This thing is gonna happen, folks. So, Arya will lead the wolf pack as Nymeria. Yay! That's not really a new prediction, though. But what about Bran taking a role in this as well? Arya can control Nymeria, but Bran might be able to control the entire pack, or groups of wolves, or to hop around from wolf to wolf when the need is present. Together, Arya and Bran could make the wolf pack a terrifying weapon, thus living up to their war king heritage. Bran has already flexed his muscle at Queen's Crown, and has subsequently learned to skin change ravens as well. By the time he comes back from Blood Raven's cave, he will be more powerful still, surely. So Martin can basically do anything he wants here. I don't see a point in hinting at the awesome power of warg kings and skin changers in battle, if not to give it to us at the end, right? Just as Arya has some very early foreshadowing of leading the wolf pack, so too does Bran. This is from A Storm of Swords, and this narrative comes from inside the wolf dream as Bran is currently skin changing Summer. Prince. A man sound came into his head suddenly, yet he could feel the rightness of it. Prince of the Green, Prince of the Wolfswood. He was strong and swift and fierce, and all that lived in the good green world went in fear of him. Far below, at the base of the woods, something moved amongst the trees. A flash of grey, quick glimpsed and gone again, but it was enough to make his ears prick up. Down there, beside a swift green brook, another form slipped by, running. Wolves, he knew his little cousins, chasing down some prey. Now the prince could see more of them. Shadows on fleet grey paws. A pack. If Bran gets a chance to skin change some more wolves in battle, perhaps this Prince of the Green fighting spirit will come back to him. We have to note that the title Prince of the Wolf's Wood, applied to Bran as he skin changes Summer, is really just a variation of War King. Tellingly, Bran's status as prince is wrapped up with his identity as a warg. So, this should be counted as foreshadowing of Bran becoming a warg king and a greenseer king. So too for Bran's words when he returns from the wolf dream and tells Jojen that, I was a prince, Jojen. I was the prince of the woods. A prince of the woods eventually becomes king of the woods. And if Bran becomes king, he'll be a weirwood king. One who defends his woods and his kin as a snarling wolf when need be. One final note from history based on thinking of Bran as a Prince of the Green, and eventually King of the Green. There is a figure in ancient Riverlands history called the Green King of the God's Eye. Although we are told nothing about this legendary king, it's safe to say that this sounds like an account of a Green Seer King. A Green King who centers his dominion on the God's Eye on the Isle of Faces would either be a Green Seer King or someone masquerading as one, and I don't think that kind of ruse would get very far. In other words, this could be yet more foreshadowing about the general idea of green seer kings coming from the Riverlands, and don't forget that Bran is a Tully also. Now you may be asking yourself, how effective wolves and ravens will be against the whites? Well, we see a flock of ravens effectively take on a dozen or so whites when Cold Hands comes to rescue Sam and Gilly, and Cold Hands also uses his ravens to take out several living Night's Watch mutineers for what it's worth. The wolves, meanwhile, can do well against the whites because breaking their bones seem to be one way to make the whites remember they are dead, as we see in A Dance with Dragons when Summer cracks the arm bone of a dead white. We also read about Summer and his pack, yes, that's right, Summer has a pack in A Dance with Dragons, falling upon a whited snow bear and tearing it to pieces, gorging upon the meat even as it moved. Ghost is also the first to smell the whites on multiple occasions, so, as you can see, there's a few ways in which the direwolves and the ravens can be effective against the whites. Thematically speaking, wolves and ravens are both carrion eaters, so it kind of makes sense that they would do well against the walking dead. 
Of course, both wolves and ravens are tied to Odin, whose shadow looms very large in George's creation of Stark and First Man culture and magic, Greenseer magic in particular. It just makes too much sense for Bran, the heir of what is basically Odinic weirwood magic, to lead wolves and ravens in the final battle, and I think it will happen. When and if it does, we can all roll our eyes together at HBO and the missed opportunity of Arya and Bran teaming up as Warg Queen and King, leading wolves and ravens into battle as their first men and children of the forest ancestors did. All right, bonus round. I've got one final clue about Arya and Bran teaming up with Children of the Forest Magic. In the Weirwood Goddess podcast series, I explored the extensive Child of the Forest symbolism of Arya Stark, most of which comes during her chapters, of course. But in addition to her being repeatedly described like a child of the forest, there's also the fact that when Bran meets his first child of the forest, he thinks it looks like Arya, and even calls her the Arya thing in his head for a while. Check it out, and this is from A Dance with Dragons, as Bran and his company are struggling to reach the entrance to Bloodraven's cave. Just when things are getting desperate... A cloud of ravens was pouring through the cave. He saw a little girl with a torch in hand darting this way and that. For a moment, Bran thought it was his sister, Arya, madly, for he knew his sister was a thousand leagues away, or dead. And yet there she was, whirling, a scrawny thing... Ragged, wild, her hair a tangle. And then after Bran momentarily blacks out and comes to inside the cave, we read... Summer was there, sniffing round him, and Hodor, soaking wet. Mira cradled Jojen's head in her lap, and the Arya thing stood above them, clutching her torch. The snow, Bran said. It fell on me, buried me. Hid you, I pulled you out. Mira nodded at the girl. It was her who saved us, though. The torch, the fire kills them. Fire burns them. Fire is always hungry. That was not Arya's voice, nor any child's. It was a woman's voice, high and sweet with a strange music in it like none he had ever heard, and a sadness that he thought might break his heart. Bran squinted to see her better. It was a girl, but smaller than Arya, her skin dappled like a doze beneath a cloak of leaves. Her eyes were queer. Large and liquid, golden green, slitted like a cat's eyes. No one has eyes like that. Her hair was a tangle of brown and red and gold, autumn colours, with vines and twigs and withered flowers woven through it. Not only is the child of the forest called the Arya thing, we also get that sly reference to Arya's nickname, No One, as Bran thinks to himself that no one has eyes like that. The part that seems like foreshadowing is the fact that the Arya thing comes to Bran's rescue when he's beset by whites. And I could definitely see Arya coming to Bran's rescue at some key moment, most likely at Winterfell. She kind of did that on the show already, but in the books I think this will, of course, involve the wolf pack. The child of the forest here, Leaf, is attacking the whites with fire and sorcery, while Bran's wolf Summer is bravely defending him. But I have to think that if Arya comes to Bran's aid, we'll see these ideas merged as Arya fights with the wolf pack. I don't think Arya has any of those cool Child of the Forest snowballs stowed away in her satchel anyway, and as you can see, her foreshadowing is basically all about her embracing her Nightwolf Stark identity and bathing in the blood of her foes. All right, that's it for today, but there is more to say about King Bran and the concept of Green Seer Kings in general. Look out for more videos in the series in coming weeks, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel here. It really helps. Thank you very much to the reader, Martin Lewis, for his vocal performances on today's video. Thanks a ton to all of our patrons, and check out LucifermeansLightbringer.com to join our Patreon campaign and help support the show, as well as receiving access to exclusive content and early releases. Cheers, and I'll see you next time.